Hello and welcome to The Beat, a news and talk program brought to you by the Center for Community Media at Worcester State University. I'm your host, Blake Thorne, and today we'll be hearing from Worcester filmmaker John Stimson. This interview was previously recorded by the director of the Center for Community Media. First, we asked Stimson to explain how he came to this point in his career. I consider myself very lucky to be able to call myself a director particularly um, and, and create the kind of content that we do, the creative content that we make here. Uh, I started as a um, performer when I was in college and then I, when I got out of school I, started, I went to, to Los Angeles and was an actor for professionally for about five years and um, on the side uh, while I was between auditions and, and classes and so forth I would read scripts for various production companies. Uh, as a freelance script reader and I would make 50 bucks a script and uh, it was a little, little bit of extra income but it also taught me and showed me um, what it took to make a, a good screenplay uh, and, and, and how much, how many bad screenplays <laughs> were out there. <laughs> that was the big thing. Um, so I, I figured I had a good head on my shoulders, a good education. I should, I can pick this up. I can learn how to, how to be a screenwriter. So I did. I started writing. And cut to uh, many years later, I, I moved back here and, uh, and sort of established myself in the commercial and corporate industrial world as a producer and, and uh, um, was doing a lot of work in that regard in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, that transitioned into uh, documentary style television work. Uh, where I did lots of half-hour programming for Discovery Network, Animal Planet, a, a, a channel called Outdoor Life, which became Versus. Um, I did a bunch of shows for Home and Garden Network. Um, and, and in doing all that programming, I learned how to edit, because it was much more efficient to, to produce the episode, but then sit down and, and cut it as well. Uh, and then I was, uh, that's, uh, that's the point at which I sort of transitioned into motion pictures and always wanted to get into storytelling, fictional storytelling and, um, and feature, feature work and uh, so I had the opportunity to make a, a movie and I jumped on it and so here I am <laughs> and that's been now 20 years and, and I've, uh, I've directed 16 movies now and written most of them and um, we found ourselves a, a cool little niche here in Central Mass. Uh, located here, live and, live and raise my family here and, and now sitting here in my office in Worcester, uh, headquarter our productions right here in the city and in the surrounding central Massachusetts area. Uh, we've found this to be our, our back lot and, and have been really welcomed by the community and it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. Next, we asked Stimson to discuss the current film project that he is working on. Well, I was lucky enough to sort of stumble into uh, <laughs> and, uh, the, this, this world of Christmas movies. <laughs> I don't know if you see these, these posters in the background here, but uh, there's those three of them. Um, but last year we came out with a movie called Christmas a la Mode, which performed really well in the marketplace. We were really lucky with it and we were able to sell it at a good price uh, to, the, to the Lifetime Network. Um, and that's kind of opened some doors for us. So we are currently in uh, post-production on our new Christmas movie called A Christmas Pirouette, which we shot right out here in uh, Worcester Common on the Skating Oval this winter. And um, uh, we're very excited about that. And uh, Lifetime and Hallmark are both tracking this movie. And I'm, I'm confident uh, that, w that we'll, we'll make a good sale with it because it's, it's really cute. It's really fun. Um, you know, so you know, that's been an interesting kind of niche to fall into. It's a very specific one, uh, but what's fun about it is that for everyone from the investing, the investors to to the crews, to the to the to the locations and the city that we worked in, and the city officials that we talked to about shooting here all responded so positively to something that was so family friendly and such an upbeat, with such an upbeat and positive message to it that it was an easy project to pull together and convince people to be part of. 
which is fun. You know, we're not doing some kind of dark, scary slasher film, film or something. That, but we, we know this is going to shine a really nice light on the city of Worcester and, and, and be the kind of entertainment that, particularly in this day and age, I think more and more people are looking for. Uh, and and uh, it will be available to a broad, broad audience. So we're really excited about that. And we're in, we have few other Christmas movies in development right now, uh, you know, the, for, for either later this spring if we can, or next fall, depending on when things kind of ease up again and we're able to, to kind of get back at it. Uh, we're, we're anticipating things are going to be kind of difficult for a while. We went on to discuss some of the highlights of his filmmaking career. Well, it's, what's really rewarding is that people all over the world get to see my work. And that's just, uh, that's sort of humbling and, and overwhelming in, in a lot of ways when you think about millions and millions of people that get entertained by what you do. Uh, even when they're smaller movies that don't necessarily get a broad theatrical release, they still get, they still get seen and people enjoy them and that's, that's great. I love that. Um, I love the idea that I've been able to work with a lot of high profile actors that were either... Um, either high profile when I got to work with them or were uh, sort of on the uprise of their career and have since gone on to be major stars. <laughs> I mean, I think about Justin Theroux, who starred in Lucy Keys, who at that time he had done a couple of smaller roles in movies. He was known for Mulholland Drive and um, American Psycho, but he hadn't really broken out. And since that movie, he's become uh, you know, an A-lister. I mean, he's, he's said amazing work that he's done, and not only just as an actor, but as a writer. I mean, he wrote Iron Man 2, which was ridiculous. Uh, you know, I love that, and that's so exciting that, that I got to work with guys like him. Digital technology is always changing, so we asked Stimson his current opinion on how filmmakers are affected by digital technology. Um, gosh, lots of ways. Lots of ways. My first film we shot on 35 millimeter film, and um, which was a, a wonderful experience. And uh, and and, and uh, but I think about how it's how radically the the medium has changed since then. And um, but at the same time, it's just. It's just the method at which you capture the image. It's not the process of telling stories that has changed. It still comes down to the script and the story and the characters and, and what, what, translating what's on the page to the screen um, in a way that's effective and moves an audience. So that's age old. That's, that's, that's still the same thing. It's just a different kind of toolkit that you use. Uh, the, the technology is fantastic. The image quality that you can, you can get now at, the, at a cost point uh, that's a lot lower is, is phenomenal. Um, there are what you know, comes with the new tools, the new, um, you know, we shoot everything in 4K now. It's going to be 6K and 8K down the road. I mean, I don't know how much more resolution people are going to be able to stomach or, ma or how much more it will matter. But we, you know, we didn't, we couldn't even have, have conceived of 4K 10 years ago even. It was out of our realm of, 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 of possibilities. As a Massachusetts-based filmmaker, we discussed what it is like to create films in the Commonwealth. Well, there's two very specific reasons that making, mass making movies here in Massachusetts is great for me, personally. <laughs> I get to live here. This is my home. This is where I raised my family. I made this choice uh, 30 years ago to move back to Massachusetts and try to make my career here um, for the lifestyle, and this is where my roots are, and, and, um, and I consider myself really lucky that I've been able to do that. I don't think there, are, there aren't, and I know there aren't, a lot of um, homegrown creative teams that are developing projects from the ground up, making them and selling them here in Massachusetts. There's tons of production coming here, which is awesome. And you know, another big benefit of shooting here in Massachusetts is the tax credit. Um, it, it is a critical piece of our bottom line on every single project we do. And with, so much so that without it, 
I'd be forced to go someplace else. And I've, I've gone to the State House and testified to that effect that you guys, <laughs> this is too important. And as long as there are tax credits uh, available elsewhere in the country, productions will go there. Um, much as Massachusetts is a beautiful state, there's wonderful locations here, uh, at the same time, you deal with the weather, you deal with the seasons. Um, it's, it isn't necessarily an ideal place to shoot. And you can do the same things elsewhere in the country or Canada or wherever. When it comes down to it, uh, it, it the decisions to shoot here or not shoot here are economic. And um, so the tax credit is a critical piece of that. We followed up by asking Stimson his thoughts on how on-demand and streaming services are changing the industry. Netflix and, and Amazon are behemoths in terms of their, the, uh, their money that they have to throw at, at their productions, and particularly their, their original productions that they are paying for and, and making for their networks, which is how they're bringing eyeballs to their networks, is they want to do quality programming, quality, quality series and movies and so forth, and it is changing the landscape. But um, things like The Irishman or you know, other the giant movies, uh, uh, what was Roma, and, you know, that, <laughs> that's a whole different league than what I'm dealing with. And um, for an independent, smaller filmmaker like myself, it's kind of, uh, it's not an option for us. They're not purchasing, they're not acquiring, they're not licensing little movies. I have to think about other network, other outlets. Yes, I can go direct to, um, to pay-per-view streaming um, platforms, but similar to having a, a little movie 20 years ago that you put out in an art house in the theater, drawing the audience without a marketing, without the marketing muscle behind it is really difficult. And uh, so um, we can get our movie up on Amazon, we can get our movie up on iTunes, or, but if we don't have people that are made aware of it through a, mar a, a big marketing campaign, you're just not going to make money, realistically. So it's, a, it's different to think about. In t so yes, that's easy to do. But to do, to do it in such a way that it's profitable is difficult. For us, we've found that um, a network sale still is the most profitable way to go. So, or not necessarily a sale, but a license deal. We make a three, four, five year deal with the network to, to air our movie, and that's where we get the money, but not from streaming. We also discussed how the motion picture industry is changing. Here's what Stimson had to say. Well, the things that I, I see that I, that I kind of regret are, are less and less um, theatrical experiences for, for film goers and film viewers. It's just less and less going to be a part of the way people consume their media. It already is. It already is, which I think is such a shame. There's nothing better, in my mind, than seeing a film in an audience, and the experience of sharing that together, hearing the laughter, hearing the sighs, the frights, the, the, the starts, it just, that's wonderful. That's, that's what I grew up with. That's what drew me to cinema in the first place, was sitting in a, in a theater with, a, with an audience. And that's less and less going to be the way people do it. Um, I think there's also going to be more and more uh, media developed and produced specifically for smaller devices, handheld devices. I mean, you see it already with Quibi. Um, I'm really interested to see how that does, where they're doing short form media, episodic stuff that'll be for the, for the phone, and where, interestingly, in a vertical format, which is wild to me. I think that's so crazy, and, uh, but it's cool. I mean, it's, it's neat that, that people are thinking that way and that there's, they're, that they're thinking that there's a viable business model that can support that kind of development of, of projects and production that will be right for the phone. Um, and I guess it makes sense. People are more and more in their own little world, zeroing in on their, on their own personal screen, and if, if, if that's a, 
a, a, a delivery method that, that can work, then great. Um, I do think there's still, and, and as, as has been proven, I, I, there's just still a need and a want for people that can, to, to, to sit down and watch a movie over an, a couple of hours and, um, and, and, in, and dive into a story and, and get taken away to a, a, a place that moves them or entertains them. Um, I think it's been interesting to watch the development of series and how um, uh, multi-episode series tend to be something that uh, that are you know like now bingeable and and people get sucked into and they will watch season after season. I think that's kind of fun. I've there've been some projects of my own that have been too big to squeeze into a two-hour, 110-page script, whatever that uh, I can absolutely see being developed into longer format series where the development of the characters can be stretched out and more thorough and deeper. I, I know I've heard interviews with um, novelists and, and other writers that have bigger, uh, denser stories that are so happy to see their work be developed into a, a multi-episode uh, platform because it just it doesn't mean having to just squeeze it down and edit it, edit it to the bare bones uh, and there's there's room for the the characters to breathe and that's kind of neat I do like that and I'm anxious to kind of think about and move into that space a little more because I haven't really cracked that nut yet and it would be fun to think about uh, doing a series of some kind so that's that's certainly on my radar Finally, we asked John Simpson if he wanted to add anything about his career, filmmaking, or the Massachusetts film scene. One thing that <clears throat> isn't necessarily on the radar of a lot of younger filmmakers and writers is the idea of, of the business of the film industry and how to make it an ongoing career for yourself or as a, as a creative person. Um, it's really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult and people don't understand or appreciate the, the amount of work that goes into developing a project, raising money for a project, being, getting to a point in your career where you have a track record that is uh, repeatable and sellable and provable, proven that you're able to actually make money for your investors. <laughs> I mean, that, that takes years and years of hard work and, uh, and, you know, it's the kind of thing that is overlooked most of the time, it seems to me. Um, so, if there were any advice I could give up-and-comers, it's to think about that, to think about, sure, there's, there's skills to learn, it's great to get on a set, it's great to, to, to learn all the pieces of the business, how it, what it takes to physically make a movie, that's, that's great, and, and it's vital. But ultimately, um, realize that it is... Uh, a lifetime's journey to get to the point where you can really call yourself a director or a, 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 an active and have a career as a writer, unless you're just extremely lucky. <laughs> there certainly are people that are really lucky and they, 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 hit, they hit something out of the park the first time, but boy, I just feel like, you know, here I am pushing 60 and I feel like I'm just getting started. On behalf of the Center for Community Media, we would like to thank Stimson for taking the time to speak with us about his magnificent career in filmmaking. Thank you for watching this segment of The Beat. Please remember to like us on Facebook and to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We will see you next time.